So the thing is, mm -hmm. I think what we've learned, and can I just say this, this is a spoiler conversation right at the very beginning. Oh, yes. I just want to mention Succession, yeah, okay. which we will review properly once it's all done. Which is two weeks' time. So if you haven't seen the latest episode, I just, want to, I just want to mention something, which is that you have always said, it was a very interesting theory, and mm -hmm. I think it's a good theory, uh, that Tom is probably the most the evil there because uh, he's choosing to be a part of this. Yes, he wasn't born into it. He has climbed that greasy pole knowing what he's doing. But what we have learned in the last... Uh, episode is that I wonder if Roman is going to turn out to be well. He's clearly a fascist, and he's going to be essentially Goebbels in this uh, in this new America. That's I just wonder if that's the way it's heading. The thing is, he's not even a fascist. That's the point, isn't it? He's just a complete opportunist opportunist who is willing to be a fascist if that's what needs to be done. I mean, there is a, there's a weird thing happening, which is that in the absence of Logan. He is sort of stepping into this. I mean, because the, the the last half an hour of the the most recent episode, which I watched at your house last yes. night, because I, I you know I went upstairs to watch the last half hour of it. You wouldn't you, you and you said, and incidentally, when it's finished, don't come down and start raving about fascism. About fascism. The thing when when he says we're calling it, we're calling it, we're calling it, and Shiv says you can't call it. She virtually says democracy is on the line, and he says you can't call it. And she, she, she said, you can't call it. And he does. And it's like, yeah, it's just, he'll just do whatever's necessary. But when there was a fire at the Count, Roman is the guy who says, yeah, oh, you, yeah, can, yeah. you can blame blacks and Jews, which you go, okay. And then he says, it was a joke. Yeah, except, except it, wasn't. it wasn't. So I I, I just think if it's going to go into, into a very dark it's, place. It's, it's brilliant, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. Welcome to the show. <laughs> Hello. And well, incidentally, may yes. I just say to any of our far-right uh, Christian Trump supporters uh, who have written in, to complain. If, if you're listening to this program and you are a far-right Christian Trump supporter, get a new uh, podcast and also get a new religion. Yes. I don't know which version of the Bible you're reading. It's the one with the Easter bunny in it. I do believe they have made a god in their own image. They have, they are, and I say this loud and proud uh, to quote New Model Army's song, uh, Christian Militia, they are worshipping the devil in the name of God. Amen. This has been a public service announcement. Also, while we're doing those, uh, Josh, our engineer, um, one of our top engineers, yes. uh, uh, he and his wife, well, Tegan, his wife, his other half, did, yes. all, did all the work. They have a baby boy called Zena. Zena, as in Zena in Cornwall. Zena, yes. Born Fantastic. on Sunday night, eight pounds, eight ounces. Oh, Congratulations. Absolutely. Zen has got a fantastic pub in it with m amazing literary history. What a great name. I've never heard of that being yeah, used yeah, as yeah. a first name. That's yeah. terrific stuff. Anyway, so congratulations. So I think um, we've upset the far right in America. Good. We've spoilt succession. Good. We've congratulated our staff. It's time to say what's on the show. <laughs> well, we're going to be reviewing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, uh I'm going to be reviewing uh, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, which is an adaptation of a very, very popular uh, book that's been around for 50 years. Uh, Bo is Afraid. You can still listen to our interview with Ari Aster, which is on uh, last week's show. And Fast X with our special guest. Yes, uh, the director of Fast... Uh, are we saying Fast X? Well, what, as opposed fast to what, Fast 10? Well, it's Fast X. I mean, it's going to be Fast 11. Fast Next. X 1. Anyway, Louis Leterrier, who's the director of that movie, now we should uh, say, will be joining us. How did that interview go, Simon? Well, well, as I'm sitting here, I can't tell you because it hasn't been done yet. So no. when you review the movie, you won't have heard that it. interview. But when you listen to the show, you will hear him speak in. before I do my review because it's being done this evening. Yes. So I won't have the benefit of Hearing having Louis heard what words. Louis says. Yeah, that's right. So, um, uh, yeah, we look forward to Louis Leterrier and Fast X chat. Um, Pretentious Moi will be, uh, will be oh, I mean, it's such a great, such a great feature. Um uh, and then what are you doing in, in the second half? Additional reviews yes. of uh, Namjoon Paik, uh, Moon is the Oldest TV, and The Other Fellow, which is a documentary about people who are called James Bond. And it's the 40th anniversary of Local Hero. Which we should uh, definitely mark. So when I say second half, what I mean is take two. Take two. I mean, I've got to use the corporate language, otherwise yeah. I might get uh, thrown out. Um, in take two, sort of all the extra takes, an extra 90 minutes of this. Uh, weekend watch list, weekend not list. Take it or leave it, you decide. Our word of mouth on a podcast feature this week. What have, what have you been watching? Uh, I've been watching uh, Mr. In Between. Can I just say on the subject of that joke that I just made, I made that same joke in last week's podcast and they cut it out. 
Well, and he's going to cut it out again. Yes, absolutely. Um, so that's that's an entertaining moment uh, for everybody. Uh, the, the pretentious moi score is Mark fourteen, uh, Mark Kermo twelve. At the twelve moment. and a half. It doesn't say. I think that half has been taken away. No, you can't take that half away because I got the film. We all know that it's twelve and a half. I'm afraid it, it says it says fourteen twelve here. It's fourteen twelve and a half. Yeah, you'll be... come back to me with agreeing that it's. <laughs> Did you watch Eurovision? I watched all of Eurovision. It was um, a, it for the first time in a long time from start to finish. Okay, I always watch it from start to finish. It was a weak year in terms of songs. I thought it was a strong year. It wasn't, though. Oh, I loved it. But the songs weren't great. Cha, cha, no, cha, that cha, was, cha, cha, cha. That was, that was the standout. But they weren't great, memorable Eurovision songs. I mean, I love that. I absolutely love the the program. Really enjoyed it. We got my friends come around. We've got the thing. We've got all the you know the the odds and everything, and we keep everything. Blah 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 blah. And we shout at the television. We do every year. Would never miss it. But I thought the songs were weaker this year. Well, I, uh, I, I, I my favorite point. I don't know what it is about Iceland, but I mean, I love Iceland anyway. But everything they do is unique. Yeah, so when they went to the Icelandic jury, who and, and instead of a very glamorous woman in a dress or a very glamorous guy making the most of their 20 seconds, he just stood there in a mask, took off three masks and said Australia and yes, got off again. It was very weird. Absolutely inspired. Catherine Tate. Yes. That was a moment. She was plugged in. She had so many boxes <laughs> on her belt. Um, so also, one frame back, also shrink the box you need to know with Ben Baby Smith and Sasha Bates, ad-free on Tuesdays alongside all your other extra content on the Take channel. You can also find Shrink the Box wherever you get your podcast. Next on the couch is David and Alexis from Shits Creek. Uh, you can support us via Apple Podcasts or head to extratakes.com for non-fruit-related devices if you are already a Vanguard Easter. As always... Go on. We salute, we salute you. you. I was... We have to do that together, but if you put in extra bits, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, as ever, we salute We you. salute. Ooh. What's the secret of comedy? Time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready? Where, you're, I know you're not ready. So Go on. Page seven. Page seven, hang on. It's a scripted bit, so, you know. Oh, is that the thing that I don't understand? Is that the thing which has got which store plug? Here we go. Okay. All right. Let's read the script. Stick a pony in me pocket. I'll fetch the suitcase from the van. Because if you want the best ones. But you don't ask questions. Then, brother, I'm your man. Because where it all comes from is a mystery. It's like the changing of the seasons. And the tides of the sea. But here's the one that's driving me berserk. Why do only fools and horses? Oh, is that what that is? That's That's what it is. I didn't know that's what those were the lyrics for. With St. Bede's Day coming up on May the 25th. Yeah. You'll be after that special something for the one you love, or at least tolerate. Why not head to store.kermadamayo.com? Is that right? Is that the address? Okay. Store.kermadamayo.com, where it. you'll find directors. <laughs> no, let's talk it up. That okay. sounds particularly That sounds great. lovely. Store.kermadamayo.com. Where you'll find directors' chairs, hot drink cups, keyring torches, and pen gift boxes, notebooks, signed posters, um, non-defaced ones are a little more expensive, but we think they're probably worth it. Stainless steel water bottles, and of course, T-shirts. Um, so, to be honest, every single person in your family is now catered for at store.kermadamayo.com, where you'll find a bunch of stuff which is lovely, high quality. It's high quality. It's none of your cheap tat. No. If it's, you want a particularly ferocious light to blind any member of your it's family, really, when really, you press the button by mistake, don't. It's, not like, it's dangerous. Uh, it's a nice pen. It's a nice box. Um, posters with us, signed posters, very lovely. We're looking particularly uh, gorgeous, I think, in them. And uh, the drinks, the drinks canisters say hello to Jason Isaacs on one side and Vanguard Easter <clears> on the other, as indeed do the coffee mugs. Good. Yeah, the uh, coffee mugs are particularly good store, because they're so easy to hold. Um Phil Hare has just had this... Here, he, here, here. Just had this conversation on Twitter, and he says, I think you might be interested. Okay. So this is a Twitter conversation, which I'm going to read out. So You're going to read it out as something. the... Tw- okay, right. fine. Can I just say, incidentally, of course, Elon Musk is an arse. Phil Hare. Dear science friends... Best hard, in inverted commas, best hard sci-fi film. Other suggestions welcome. 
So Captain Science then joins Captain in. Captain Science. Adam Rutherford consults on science in films. I'm sure he has researched it thoroughly. Then Adam Rutherford joins in saying, Annihilation. Oh, I love Annihilation. One of Obama's favourite films of that year. Phil Hare says, wasn't that the one you consulted on? Oh, was it? Okay. Adam Rutherford says, might have been. <laughs> might have been. <laughs> Phil Hare then comes back. I think there's room for a podcast where yourself and Professor Brian Cox discuss your experiences on consulting for mad sci-fi, maybe with Mark Kermo to make it legit. Then Professor Brian Cox joins in and says, I'm in. So oh, we well. could make it happen. So Professor Brian, Dr. Rutherford, drop us an email, correspondence at kermanameo.com. I mean, I, clear, I notice I don't have a role in this new podcast. Well, the, I think the, the reason that is because I did an on stage with Danny Boyle and Professor Brian Cox about mm. Sunshine. Yeah. Um, because Professor Brian Cox was the was the consultant on Sunshine. And I, that's when Danny Boyle first told me all that stuff about the God particle. Um, I, so I hadn't seen that because I'm not on Twitter because of Elon Musk. Um, but yeah, let's make that happen. That'd be great. And I do what? Will you bring what? glamour? By what? Being there. Mm. Not that impressed. You know more about science than I do. Well, exactly. One of us is exactly, a, a yeah. trilogy of children's books all around <laughs> the periodic right. table. Exactly. And it ain't you. Precisely so. Um, uh, how's, been, how's the opera doing? I've been on Inf uh, Infinite Monkey Cage as well. I was a guest have on you? that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, I have a, I have a little bit of... Uh, the, uh, the opera is... Uh, looking pretty. I saw some film of two of the arias this week, and it's amazing. Are they singing in, in English or in Italian? It's, no, it's English. Okay, very, very English. Because we were talking yesterday about the fact that opera always sounds better in Italian. Well, I'm sure it'll take off and then be translated okay. into Italian. Um, so if you want to uh, get involved in anything, just email correspondence at covenamayo.com. Don't forget you can buy stuff as well. <laughs> There's Italian. always stuff to Too buy. Needy. Uh, right, let's talk about a movie uh, that is out, which you might like. Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, which is a new film by Kelly Freeman Craig, who made Edge of Seventeen, which is adapted from the book by Judy Bloom, first published over half a century ago, uh, 1970. Um, Abby Ryder Fortson is 11-year-old Margaret. Rachel McAdams is her mother. Benny Safdie. Uh, did you interview the Safdie brothers um, when Uncut Gems was out? Yes. Yes, fine. So Benny yes, Safdie is the dad. Kathy Bates is her grandmother. Um, her mother was raised Christian. Her father was raised Jewish. She is being left to decide for herself at some point in the future which religion, if any, she uh, she wants to, to be in. The family is moving from New York to New Jersey. And we first hear the full title of the film, which, as you know, <laughs> offers you the opportunity to, to stand up, applaud and leave very early on in the film. And she says, are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Please don't let this move happen to New Jersey. I don't want to go to New Jersey. But if you can't do that, just let New Jersey not be too horrible. When she gets to New Jersey, she meets her new neighbour, Nancy, who says, hello, I live in the bigger house up the street, which tells you what you need to know about Nancy's character. They play together under the sprinklers and uh, Nancy says, oh, you're still flat. I'm going to have a pretty big chest. And she teaches her about this exercise, which is apparently a thing I must, I must. I must, I must increase my bust. How do you know that? I remember, I don't know. Okay. I think my mum said it. Okay. Um, Long anyway, time ago. so Nancy then says, we're going to have a secret club. Uh, the rule is you can't wear socks. Um, you have to wear a bra. You have to be interested in boys and you have to do all these rules. Otherwise, you can't be a member of the club. So the next thing is she's off to the store with her mother. Here's a clip. Excuse me. Uh, we're looking for a bra for my daughter. Hmm. Well, we don't have many that small, but come with me, dear. I'll measure you. Arms up, dear. Hmm. Barely a 28. Not even a double A. Your best bet is going to be to go with one of these okay. grow bras here. So one day when you do grow, it'll grow with you. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks. We'll just go try it on. Um, oh, yeah. Can I just, I'll just, yep, here we go. Oh, this is always the tough bit. I can't even do this to this day. Okay, all right. Can I see? How's that feel? I cannot wait to take it off. Yeah. Welcome to womanhood. Which is a great line. Yeah. 
So you can see from that that there's a touch of Catherine Colbertie in the tone of this. There's also a thing going on in the secret club. It's, you know, who's going to get their period first and nobody wants to be the person to get their period last. So again, as in the case of Catherine Colbertie, it has a, you know, a very refreshing frankness about uh, subjects that in the past, uh, some literature and particularly cinema has been very squeamish about. She's wrestling with adolescence. She's wrestling with the idea of boys. She's wrestling with the idea of God. Her her prayers, which all begin, you know, God, are you there? It's um, are you there, God? It's me. Uh, they're like diary entries. So effectively, we get to hear her inner thoughts by her talking to God. She ends up doing a school project on religion because her teacher tells her that this is what she should do. But because of this kind of rift within her family uh, on the grandparents' side. She says, what I learned about religion is that it makes people fight. I've prayed and prayed, but everything just gets worse. There's nobody up there. There's only just me. The thing I really liked about this is that alongside that stuff, there's also really funny, lighter stuff. At one point, somebody gets the father's anatomy book and they look at pictures, you know, the most people in there. She says, what's that? It looks like a thumb. They play um, spin the bottle and the needle drop that they use in the spin the bottle is is preacher man. Um, It's... Everyone in the film is going through changes. It's not just her. Rachel McAdams' mum has given up her her art and her teaching in order to, to to do the move, and she's now facing a life bereft of the things that that she loves. The grandparents often behave more like children than the children do, and it's it's funny and it's really well played. It's really well written. It's a much loved book and a you know much revered book. It's interesting that it's taken such a long time to get to the screen. I think there is an argument that had it had it been made in the past, it would have had to soft pedal a lot of the stuff that makes the film what it is. But you know, I was talking before about sometimes there's a dearth of movies for a younger audience. This, in exactly the same way as Catherine Colbert, is it's it's lovely. It's really charming and funny and open and and hooray for it. And I smile all the way through. Elisa says, Dear Super Fudge and Dini, I was at a packed preview screening oh, of good. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret at the weekend. I devoured all of Judy Bloom's books in my preteen years. They played an essential part in trying to figure out the whole puberty thing and were a source of information and reassurance that wasn't available to me elsewhere. I was unsure when I heard about the film adaptation because the book had such a special place in my heart, but I needn't have worried. Kelly Freeman Craig has really captured the spirit of the book, and Abby Ryder Fortson is a perfect Margaret. She's fabulous. In fact, the whole cast is wonderful. The film is full of warmth and it handles the awkwardness and angst of being a preteen with great charm. It's depressing to see that some of Judy Bloom's books are banned in parts of America simply because they tackle the realities of adolescence. Hopefully, the film will introduce a whole new generation of young readers to her books, and in doing so, will help them understand that everything they're going through is completely normal, up with empowering young girls and down with nonsensical literary censorship, says Lisa. And can I just add once again, if you are one of the people listening who thinks that any of those books should have been banned in America, get yourself another podcast and And another religion. Also, Lisa, uh, on that point, uh, check out The Power, which is on, I can't remember which channel, I think it's on, it's on Amazon Prime, Eddie Marzan, with this singular idea to just think he's fantastic and I'm so jealous He's fantastic in everything. He is. But what if girls and women suddenly became more powerful than men and everything unwraps from there and it's it fantastic. Anyway. should also say, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret is a PG certificate film. Uh, BBFC says mild sex references, references to racism and emotional upset. Okay. Um, still to come, Mark will be reviewing these films. We will be reviewing uh, Ari Aster's uh, Bo is Afraid and we'll be reviewing... Fa- what are, is it? I now I've always Fast also X. Fast well, X. Let's say Fast it's X. Fast X. Yes, Fast X. Um, and we'll be back before you can say, each generation must discover its mission, fulfil it or betray it in relative opacity. Obviously, the words of Franz Fanon, a Martinique philosopher. Martinique philosopher. That's a philosopher. I mean, he drank martini. No, it's a philosopher from Martinique. Oh, I see. The French Caribbean island. Ah. That that went well. And we're back. Uh, This is from Alice. Thank you, Alice. You can uh, send your emails to correspondence at coburnamayo.com. Bell it any way you like. Dearest Mark and Simon, heritage listener, member of the Vanguard, first time emailer. Like Simon, I too greatly enjoyed the 2004 movie The Day After Tomorrow. We had the film on DVD and it was something I returned to several times to the point that I internalised the scientific reasoning for the climate disaster in the film. Fast forward then to 2008 to my GCSE geography exam. By the way, good luck to all households that are going through GCSEs. And A-levels. And finals. 
and finals and Scottish hires. And remember, the only piece of exam advice which you need to remember, F-T-H, uh, R-T-F-Q. Which is? Read the flipping question. Oh, very good. Uh, our kids had a geography teacher who used to write that on the board. R-T-F-Q. Read the flipping question. 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 Everything boils down Very to that. Good. Fast forward to 2008 to my GCSE geography exam, and I'm faced with a question about global warming. I don't know whether the science in the day after <laughs> tomorrow is sound, <laughs> but I regurgitated the theory, minus the characters and plot, very convincingly, so much so I came away with an A star. Wow. To this day, I don't, brilliant. I don't know if I was being clever or stupid, but the exam board seemed to like it. Hello to Jason <laughs> and all the good stuff from Alice. P.S. In case you need a reminder, the theory of the film, global warming causes large-scale polar ice melting. The freshwater previously held in the ice upsets the salt balance in the sea which in turn affects the Gulf Stream without the Gulf Stream the world's weather isn't able to regulate itself through ocean currents and thus we are plunged into the next ice age now I've written that out says Alice I'm starting to think I got lucky in my exam anyway, I'm sure people will <laughs> that's genius it is how fantastic that a disaster movie got you an A star in a proper in a proper exam as opposed to your geography teachers uh so box office uh yes. top 10 at number 20 oh actually before we get to the box office top 10 just this on the michael j fox movie which oh, you yeah. were talking about last it. week and you said that i would like it and you were absolutely right you saw it yes yes um isn't he great he is absolutely great uh this is um the name has come off the bottom here okay can you just tell me who this is from please the michael j fox dear doc and Martin. oh i've got it it's at the top. My apologies. You told me I'd like it, and you're absolutely right. Um, I did. It's from Alan Wonderful. Potter, MTL, second time emailer, NVQ level five, and winner of a copy of The Secret of My Success on VHS. <laughs> As someone who is back to the future in their top 10 movies of all time and a person who at 17 years old, his Friday evenings consisted of episodes of Spin City followed by Caroline in the City on Channel 4, there was no way I was going to miss out on an opportunity to see this documentary and not being a consumer of fruit-based products or entertainment, I took a trip down to the Duke of York Picture House in Brighton for my one opportunity to see this film. From the opening moments of Michael on his now daily exercise regime, taking a walk, showing him falling over, a female member of the public going to help, help him again gets up and tells her she is uh, she knocked him off his feet Genius. i was smiling you can tell he is as charming as ever able to disarm the most awkward of circumstances with a joke and not afraid to make it at his own expense still is an incredibly earnest open no holds barred account of michael j fox's life and career the whirlwind success story going from sucking on jam packets because you can't afford food to owning <laughs> four cars having the two top movies at the box office and your face on every magazine is vividly told through smartly edited clips of uh, movies, TV shows and interviews with dramatic performance reenactments used when no clips were available. I think they did that better than any, any other Yeah, the use of clips and dramatisation in that film is absolutely on the money, a star. This was also intercut with his everyday life now, daily physio sessions, talking head interviews, where you can hear he's even entertaining the crew and making them laugh. Yeah. I know you, can, you can hear the, the crew yes, laughing off great. camera, which is really I know brilliant. he wouldn't want this, but I couldn't help feel sad for the great talent that he was and what he has become. At the same time, as I was just in awe of his remarkable resolve and determination that this debilitating disease would not define him. I think I would have liked a bit more of the family's point of view in this, especially more from Tracy, who's his other half, who gains my utmost respect for really giving a meaning to the words in sickness or in health till death us do part. This is Michael in his own words that is most vulnerable and yet most determined. You can tell this is a story he wanted to get out while he could. He says himself in 20 years time, I'll either be cured or I'll be a pickle. An incredibly moving story. I laughed, I cried, I was entertained and informed. What more do you want from a documentary? Up with stem cell research and down with degenerative disease. I mean, the Thank only, you, Alan Potter. The only comment I have on that is I think that he still is uh, a great talent. And I think one of the things that I loved about the documentary is how funny his his comic timing is. I mean, the, the thing about Parkinson's is obviously it throws your timing completely off. And yet somehow his, his comic timing is like Abba's songwriting. It's indestructible. There is just something about his. I mean, he he tells that beautifully when he's got the side of his face is bashed, and it's because he fell over and and bashed himself on the on the bedstead. And uh, he says, "What you fell over?" He said, "Yeah, this is the rule. I fall over. You know, gravity is real, even when you only fall from my height." Yeah, which and it's it's perfect. And he he I, he perfectly delivers that line when the interviewer says, "How's Tracy?" and he says, "Married to me, still." It's 
And I, still, yeah. of course, is the name also. Of the exactly. Name. And it's it's just, I I think he still is a comic genius, as he always was. And it's it's so... It's so empowering and uplifting, and I'm starting to well up even thinking about it. So if you get a chance to see it, you've missed it in the cinema, I suspect, but if you've got Apple TV+, Plus, yeah. watch it. If you've got a friend who's got it, then yeah. uh, then it's definitely worth it. Number 28, brainwashed sex camera power. Now, I've got there's an incredible epistle here from okay. Bernie Harper, PhD, photographer and vision scientist. Okay, wow. I will just read some of it. Okay. Because as you can see, it's like a there, thesis. Yes, it is. All right. That's that's single space as well. Yeah, and all this is, so I'll just, okay. I'll just do a bit. Dear esteemed doctors, the academic rigor of Nina Menke's brainwashed sex, which is brainwashed colon, sex hyphen camera hyphen power, is a devastating deconstruction of the male gaze in cinema. It quite correctly shows movies to be an institutionally formulaic subjunction of women. Su I beg your pardon, subjugation of women. Her remarkable and disturbing examples of actress and audience manipulation barely scrape the surface of Hollywood's industrialised levels of abuse. But she often struggles to explain why female directors and cinematographers also recycle the same male visual narratives. Even her perfect example... From Mandingo fails its own test. The enslaved Ken Norton is indeed photographed in exactly the same way women have been objectified and abused for decades on film. But when his slave master and sexual predator Susan George is portrayed in the same scene, she is lit with beauty lighting, typical of a classic Hollywood movie. The graphic 3D lighting always used for, for the male protagonist's gaze is meticulously avoided, and there are good reasons. It's over... And we take a slight left turn. It's over 20 years since Terry Wogan, not someone I think you imagined to have come up in this. No, I hadn't thought that's where it was going. Ribbed my PhD research into the flattening and fattening effects of photography. He correctly reported my findings that the camera can easily add 10 pounds, 4.5 kilos, in body weight. He then reassured his audience that in reality, he looked like Errol Flynn. Michael Parkinson warmed to this comedic theme too and said that quote on screen I chunk up like John Wayne but in real life I look like Callista Flockhart however that 10 pound excess weight excess weight was a group average in reality men often survive the camera scrutiny relatively unscathed it is women that are far more likely to photograph as significantly overweight older and less attractive as you all know from personal experience celebrities almost never look like they do on the screen usually they are smaller slimmer and often younger looking. Well, I'm not. <laughs> so, so this fin final point here from Bernie. And clearly, that was his research. That whole thing yeah. about television putting on. So, what is going on here? The process cameras used to squeeze the infinite depths of 3D reality into a two-dimensional image on film is flawed. It is a compression process that throws away vast amounts of the vital information we need to understand our visual reality. All that is left is a two-dimensional linear perspective with just enough resolution, brightness, and color information for us to approximate the original scene. Actors, of course, are not models, but they often feel compelled to slim excessively, and many actresses lose so much weight uh, they risk their health and even infertility simply to look good uh, on camera. Um, anyway, so that's just like a, a, a flavour. He says, P.S., sorry about the epic length of the missive, but this is the short version, of which I have shortened it well, um, even more. But anyway. Well, here's an interesting thing on the subject of Nina Menkes. So there's a uh, Nina Menkes uh, season at the BFI at the moment, a celluloid sorceress. I was at BFI on Monday and I did an interview with her on stage. I asked her to pick a guilty pleasure movie. She picked The Exorcist and she picked it because she thinks it's a feminist classic. And she spoke really, really eloquently, and clearly this is music to my soul, about how the central relationship in The Exorcist, which is to do with Reagan and Chris McNeil, um, and the absence of the father, the father who has abandoned uh, has abandoned the family, Howard, Captain Howdy, is really what the film is about. And she talked about watching it as a young age in which there was some biographical crossover with her own life. And she said it, she thinks it's a very, very feminist. And it, it, it was really lovely to hear somebody. She wasn't talking about it as a horror film. She wasn't talking about it as a thing. And she, she anyway, she argued. So we bonded. We bonded very, very strongly over the fact that she's just done this documentary and she thinks The Exorcist is a feminist classic. And who am I to disagree? We're going to zip through uh, these numbers uh, to get to the number one. Okay. Uh, number 26 is Plan 75. Which is a really uh, moving and fascinating film about uh, planned euthanasia that has one, one uh, foot in uh, science fiction, but another foot in present-day reality. Uh, number 12... 
The Eight Mountains. Significant most of all because it has introduced me to the sublime work of Daniel Norgren, a Swedish singer-songwriter who has become my new favourite thing. There's an album, Alabersi, which he many of the songs come from that. I've been trying to I've been trying to turn you on to uh, Daniel Norgren's wonderful songs. Uh, UK, at number 10, nine in America is Air. All About the Shoe. Uh, number nine, Dungeons and Dragons, Honour Among Thieves. So much more fun than we had any right to expect. John Wick, chapter four, is number eight this he's, week. He's up the stairs, he's down the stairs, he's up the stairs again. Uh, UK, number seven, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry. Enjoyed it very much, Life of Brian. UK's number six is 2018. Which wasn't a uh, press screen, so I haven't seen it. Uh, number five here and number five in the States, Evil Dead Rise. Was away, haven't caught it up. Sorry, sir, dog ate my homework. You did say last week. I and know, but I know, week. but a lot of things happened. But you keep saying you're going to see it and you, ne- you never I, see I it. I am going to see it. Well, you're probably I not. When, well, no, I am. I want I to see so. it. I don't think you will, ever. Number four here, number three in America, Book Club, the next chapter. Well, I'm sure they all had a nice holiday. Uh, Venice does not look like that in real life. It's crammed with tourists. Number three here, number eight in the States, Love Again. I didn't get invited to a screening of this, but as we came out of Bo is Afraid, James King was going to a screening of it. He's the man. So I feel like that's it. I've, the, the mantle has not just been passed, but I have been passed over. Number two here, and in America, the Super, Super Mario Brothers movie. Well, I think you were right. The Super Mario Brothers movie. I mean, uh, number one here and number one in the States, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. This v- Very dark and uh, actually all the better for it. This is just signed by the letter P. So whoever you are, P, thank you for this. Okay. To break up a soggy bank holiday weekend, my wife arranged for a family viewing of Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3, in our local restaurant, Everyman Cinema. Like my wife and I, my two girls, aged 14 and 12, have been Marvel fans for some time. Although it's been a while since we felt a Marvel film was special enough to warrant a cinema visit. And apparently, talk in the playground is that Marvel's cool rating is quickly slipping. I came to the screening with fond memories of the first instalment, which, like many of the early Marvel movies, was full of wit and well-developed characters. I was also a fan of James Gunn's other work, including Suicide Squad, so was bitterly disappointed to find five minutes into Volume 3 I was already bored and frustrated. The writing had switched from witty to corny, the acting consisted mainly of shouting, and the music, used so brilliantly throughout the first instalment, seemed forced and ever-present. My wife and kids enjoyed it more than I did, but still recognised that it was all over the place. Over the years, I've been a staunch defender of Marvel, especially in the face of some of my more highbrow friends who've dismissed it as superficial trash and an existential threat to Art House Cinema, which I also love. So, just to check that I hadn't been wrong all along, I rewatched Avengers Endgame and the first Iron Man and how right I was. For me, these two films are the high bar of Marvel, telling relatable human stories in the guise of superhuman players. The scripts are tight, Editing is well-paced, and the actors, by and large, play the role straight. They are still mistakenly comic creations, but are created for an appreciative adult audience, not children. Volume 3, by contrast, felt insincere, over-egged, and simply lacked the heart that these characters have conveyed when on screen in the past. Whilst I'm sure I will continue to enjoy early Marvels, I am beginning to think their time has run its course. Perhaps... As with the James Bond franchise, when in reaction to the pastiche films of the 80s and 90s, we got a more grown-up reboot, Marvel need the same. Hello to Jason and so on. I mean, I'm surprised because I think that uh, no mention there of the of the Rocket story, which is, the. I mean, I think that the film, the bulk of the film is the Rocket backstory, the animal experimentation, the vivisection, the Richard Adams stuff, which I th- found very, very moving. The stuff I'm less interested in is the smashy, bashy, crashy stuff. But I thought this was, and actually, funnily enough, it was as we were coming out of that screening, we walked past James King. He was off to see a movie that they weren't going to show to me. And he said, "Where are you, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And he went, oh, it's really dark. And he was right. Louis Leterrier is on the way. So we're joined today by a French film director and producer who's best known for his work in action films. He directed the first two Transporter films, uh, The Incredible Hulk, Clash of the Titans, Now You See Me, and the 10th Fast and Furious instalment. Fast X is out this Friday. You can hear my interview with Louis Leterrier after this clip, which will be very noisy. You remember my father? Hernan Reyes. My father was a horrible man. Very bad daddy. 
But I kind of liked him, and you took him from me when you stole our money and left us with nothing but suffering. That's what I came here for. To end that suffering. Oh, and I didn't take that money. I burned it. That's a clip from Fast X. I am delighted to say we've been joined by its director, Louis Leterrier. Uh, where are you, Louis? Where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from Malibu, California. Very nice to uh, to speak to you. Thank you for spending some time. Before we get lost in the Fast X world, I just wanted to remember to say to you how much I loved Lupin. No, Lupin, thank you. Uh, on television. I think you did three of the episodes there, yes, and you've just done a movie with Omar C. And I just thought there was one of those COVID things that we found and discovered and thought it was terrific. Oh, thank you, Simon. Oh, thank you so much. No, I, lo I, I loved it. It was amazing. And I love Omar. So I just wanted to do that before I hit it, oh, fell yeah, off the good. end and I forgot to mention that's it. Yeah. So, in, so introduce us to um, to your movie, introduce us to the world of Fast X. I know there's, there's a lot of backstory, but just bring us into the picture here. Well, it's a lot of backstory. So obviously <laughs> it centers around uh, Dom Toretto and his family, his, his white family, which is composed of direct uh, uh, family members and friends. And they have, for the last 20 years, they've been defending the truth, you know, fi uh, fighting for the light against the darkness. And they, a villain, is coming back from the past, uh, seeking revenge. And he's going to hit Dom Torito where he hurts the most, his family. Yeah. Family. Um, so <laughs> uh, I want to talk about Jason Momoa uh, in a bit, but just to scroll back just momentarily, how did you get the call for directing this movie? I know there's a lot of interest in this, but it is. I, I, I still think it's an it's an incredible story. Tell us how you got the call. Well, yeah, I can tell you. I, I got the call. I literally was finishing a movie with uh, Omar C. I, I was finishing the dub version, the English version uh, of the movie when my phone rang and he was the president of Universal. And it was so late, it was midnight. And so I thought it was a pocket call. I texted him, you, you must have made a mistake. Thank you so much. Good to hear, uh, good to see your name on my phone. And he said, no, 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 call me right away now. And it's midnight. Okay, I called him and he told me that there was a possibly a switch of directors on the Fast franchise. And would I be interested? Obviously, he said yes, maybe. I mean, I was, I was, I was. I, I didn't, my the words wouldn't weren't coming out of my mouth at this point. It just sounds. And so right. he said, oh, "Let me send you a script. Read it. If you like it, let's talk again at five a.m." And it was midnight. I read it once, twice, three times. Had a call with them uh, at five. Told them how great the script was, how much I love this franchise, and passed. Passed because I because I didn't think I would be able to do what. I do and or any director does in the with with no runway literally take me you know, take this franchise to new heights uh, with no prep it was very very difficult to do so uh they said sorry goodbye and I walked into my bedroom so my wife she opened one eye she said you look very pale what happened I said they offered me fast <gasps> and I passed what and she literally grabbed me by the collar shook me and said what did you do call them that call them back right away i called them back i said is there still an opening have you called anybody else i said yeah yes but but you know let's get back on the phone i we did and and that's it that's uh, history I, you know three days later i was on a plane and then four days later i was calling action on fast 10. You don't pass on fast. That's basically what your wife was saying. So she's yeah. she's the hero. Never mind Jason or or <laughs> Vin. The hero of this movie is your wife. Yeah, that she is the true hero of yeah of this movie very much. So yes. If this had gone conventionally, Louis, would you have been attacked like three months before? Would you have been working on this for no, three, four, yeah, six months, years? Yeah, no, no. It takes it takes a year or so. You know, the, these movies they're. You know, it's it's twenty five cast members. It's it's five global locations. No, it takes it takes a year or so to to prep. So no, it it, it was it was a that that really is why I passed because I know the enormity of the task. Uh, yeah, and so 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 yeah, it would have been a year a year a year and a half. So how long from that pocket dial that wasn't a pocket dial <laughs> from the head of Universal to you saying action? action. How long? Five days. Less than a week, five days, absolutely. Yeah, that's impossible. 
you it's impossible. You can't possibly have <laughs> got up to speed. What was going what was going through your head at that well, time? Because I, like, I okay, know you've got great experience with these movies, but I, this I, is still an incredible you. story. It, it, I, I have experience, but not that type of experience. So so it it was the greatest climb, it was the the biggest meal. It was so so I looked at it as as really a you know eating the elephant one bite at a time like really focusing on the task at hand you know the the the, the morning i was going to direct what was the first thing i was going to do what was the second thing i was going to do then you know taking okay. every moment i had off from the set and and working and and shot listing and rewriting and talking to the crew the crew was Spread out around the world, like really, they would do. You had actors in Rome. I was in London. You had, you know, actors prepping in Portugal, or crews prepping in Portugal, and I had to gather everyone. And at the same time, being a Fast and Furious director, you have to be sort of the general of an army. You cannot be always in the front line. You 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 need to guide people in the right direction, but from afar. And that's what I did. I, I had so many monitors. Sometimes it felt like I was the head of NASA calling action in in mm-hmm. Rome, cut, and action in Portugal, cut, and ready in uh, London, go. And, and and having different channels to talk to my actors or talk to the second unit directors. It was It's a very different idea than than people have of these of these movies like you really are sometimes boots on the ground but sometimes you're really remote and you're doing the same thing it's very interesting and and i think you know the, the you know having done so much remotely in the last three years that actually was very helpful i realized that there, that was possible to to get quality interaction um through computers uh, how many of the people working on this had you worked with before, Louis? I know you came quite close to getting Fast 8, so you'd kind of been a part of this world and come close. But how many of these people who you're now working with on a daily basis, because you're their boss, essentially, <laughs> no. how many knew you? I'm not the boss. I'm I'm, I'm a, a member of the family. There's no boss. Uh, maybe Vin Diesel. Uh, the studio I knew very well. Obviously, Jason Statham, because we started our yes. careers together. And uh, here and there, a couple of actors, but, you know, Natalie Emmanuel, I did um, Dark Crystal. She was the voice of uh, one of our Gelflings. So we, we very, you know, apart from Jason Satham, who I knew and had done like many, you know, a couple of movies with him and a few commercials. Uh, now, I, I, I got to know everyone. And frankly, to tell you the truth, it was like the, the it was an instant instantaneous uh, uh, love with every member of this cast and this crew like i didn't change anyone i i just walked in and 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 sat on the driver's seat and you know pressed the turbo and off we were in these meetings is the meeting with vin diesel the, the crucial one yeah. you know you guys have to be on the same page because there was talk of artistic differences with justin lin and so on but you guys have to be absolutely agreeing on everything. Would that be right? That's the crucial relationship. Yeah, I, I, completely. I cannot, will not make a movie with somebody I don't agree with, or, you know, or have a different direction. I mean, I frankly, no one should. Like, no, there's no good movie that came out where people had uh, the artistic differences and wanted to do different movies. So I think, you know, we, we getting on that phone call, and frankly, that was the last phone call, that was the last Zoom uh, with Vin, and then I'm, I'm not saying this just because we're doing a press interview today, we finished each other's sentences. We had the same views mm. of the franchise. I am a true fan. My career was defined by the bar that was set by the Fast and Furious franchise. These characters, I understand, I know they're, they're you know, and I also realize the power that they have, uh, the global power that they have over the people. Uh, we were in, in Mexico yesterday with Vin, and just to to see 6,000 people chanting Toretto, Toretto, 6,000 people in unison. They, there's no difference really between Vin Diesel and Dom Toretto for, for people. And frankly, in real life, there's no real difference between Vin Diesel and mm-hmm. Dom Toretto. What I did with all these actors was actually meet them and then bring them closer to the characters they portray. Uh, tell us about Jason Momoa's Dante, because um, he's getting a lot of the press <laughs> Quite correctly, <laughs> he's an extraordinary character. Somewhere between, I don't know, uh, a Batman baddie, Jack Sparrow, Eddie yeah. Izzard. I don't know. T- t- tell us, how would you describe Dante? 
It's funny, Eddie is always a, is a great, yeah. I, I, I was lucky to work with Eddie once. Don't take- Do you think that's right? Do you think there's some Eddie is out in oh, there? Oh, that's actually a really great one. You're the first one to say that, but that's exactly actually right. And meeting Eddie and seeing how Eddie worked, I actually guided Jason to work this way. I mean, there's so much, I would, you know, I was telling you about Vin, but like there's so much Eddie Izzard in his performance. What I did was to meet Jason and I was like, you are, there's so much life oozing out of every pore of your body, yeah, the, the hair, the laughter, like he's, he's a, he's out of our time, out of our universe. It's like, you know, he's like four people at once, just incredible. So what I did was to actually bring Jason into his character and to allow him to be as fun and, and operatic as he wanted to be like really, really, we conceived him as a Baroque uh rococo character mm. big fun uh an explosion of chaos but also at the same time it's because he's a great actor being able to turn on the dive and be absolutely terrifying uh and that's how we've conceived him yeah as you come on at the last minute and you're in and you're fully uh, involved and you and you love all the people mm. presumably it's too late to make changes is it do you there is a vision for 10 there's a vision for 11 mm. i think that's the end of the french i don't know but you know presumably you you're just going with this or do they give you the space louis to say actually can we do that slightly differently no you're right simon though they really give me the space the script was great the script that that justin Lin and dan mazo had written was was fantastic but it's just you know, just like every script it's just a blueprint towards uh, uh you know guiding you towards in one direction the direction unfortunately could not be fulfilled because we lost the location so half of the movie had to be changed just by necessity and then you know when you change half of a movie you have to sort of like correct and on top of that i had to bring my own well I, yeah i can only direct what i think is right you know so so i uh, i i i change and 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 twisted a couple of things but but frankly you know it all stems from from what was created before now the next one the you know the the, the direction now that's you know the blank yeah yes the the page is completely blank my computer in front of me has a cursor <laughs> blinking right now and it's just like okay where are we going where are we going i know where we're going i know where we were ending Vin Diesel was very clear and we talked about this and i talked to everyone about where this franchise is ending. Um, but the road to lead us there is going to be very interesting. So is it def so it's definitely finishing with that thing that you're about to write on that cursor in front of you? Yeah. That's the end of it. Because some people were thinking that uh, Vin had suggested there was a trilogy to finish, but is that true? You know, the, the thing about Fast and Furious, I think the thing about any fantastic franchise is that they treat each movie separately every movie has to be the best the best movie possible if you if you think about the next movie the movie after this movie you're going to fail so we really are focusing on the next one uh, but as i told you simon we absolutely know where we're ending so the road might take us in a different direction because obviously that's the beginning and and uh, of our creating uh, creative process and also, we are also listening to the fans. We're listening to the audience. We we are going to see how this audience is reacting to part one. Uh, so let's see where it takes us. Uh, but yeah, the end is near. I can tell you. I can promise you. The end is near, but it might not be in the next film. It might be another one. Let's see. Let's see. We'll see. We'll see. I know, just, just before we finish, it is worth mentioning that in your film, Louis, you have four Oscar-winning women yeah, that, uh, in this movie. I'm not sure many films can actually claim that, but that's testament to what the franchise has delivered. It's a testament to what the franchise has delivered. It's also, uh, and it's very important to say that these women have reached out to be in the movie, uh, and so did most of the actors. It, uh, you know, this franchise was and is something that is known in the world, in you know, in our creative world, as a, a just an explosion, literal explosion of fun on screen, where the actors can really give their best and do something quite different than what they do uh, 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 elsewhere. So when Charlize Theron came, when Brie Larson reached out and and spent a weekend uh, with Vin Diesel and his family. That was out of love. That really was as fans. And it's interesting to to see the the behind the the scene of this movie where everybody really collaborates and everybody's always talking to each other and really trying to make this movie the next one 
the fast universe as great as, as, great as it can be. Uh, Louis Leterrier, we appreciate all the time you spent with us today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Simon. Talk to you soon. Uh, Louis Leterrier uh, speaking to me, even though... Now, we, as we mentioned at the beginning um, of yes. this particular podcast, Mark hasn't heard that interview. And in fact, neither, hasn't n- neither have I, because it hasn't happened yet. Um, How so, was it? Well, my guess is he was outrageously French and very good, because it is, it is his movie, and it's an astonishing yeah. story. I, I mean, I know this kind of thing happens, but to be in that position where from you know you get a call from the head of Universal saying, can you take over this franchise, to the moment where you actually call action, it's like five days or whatever it was, is incredible. How do you even begin to get your head around that kind of project in that amount of time? Well, you know, he that's it's what he does. He's uh, you know, he's he's the safe pair of hands who can do any and, and it's not like he hasn't got a you know, a very sort of fine box office track record. So, having not heard the interview and having no idea what he said uh, in, in the interview. So, this is uh Fast X or Fast 10 as you were sort of calling it then, which is the 10th chapter but the 11th movie if you count Hobbs and Shaw. And as has been pointed out, one of the weird things about the the Fast and Furious film series, which of course began life as a B racing street racer, as a B movie street racer thing, which was inspired by a magazine article, so very much kind of down on the floor stuff. Yeah. The titles are so Fast and the Furious, Too Fast, Too Furious, Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift, Three, Fast and Furious, Four, Fast Five. Fast and Furious 6, Furious 7, the F8 of Fast and F8 okay. of Fast and the Furious, F9 and Fast X. I'm very confused. With Hobbs and Shaw in the middle and exactly where they were geographically. So, um, in the first film, as I said, uh, you know, street racing, a little bit souped up, camera going through all the, you know, the, well, not cameras, obviously, uh, CG, going into the carburetors and the injection and the nitrous, bloody, bloody, blah, this. Um, the most that then sort of turned into this behemoth, basically Mission Impossible series, in which, well, it's not really about street racing anymore. It's about huge international stuff. So, in uh, one of the most recent uh, offerings, they strapped a rocket onto a car and shot a couple of cast members into space. Right. Which has always delighted me because if you know anything about the airplane movie, or the airport movie, it's not the airplane movie, it's the airport movie. So airport takes place in an airport. Airport 75, plane in the air, gets hit by a smaller plane, person winched in on the end of a piece of string. Airport, and I have to get this right, is it 77 is the one in which it goes under the sea and it turns into a submarine. Uh, the one after that, the Concorde, which I think is 79 or 80, depending where you were, flips out of the Earth's atmosphere and becomes a spaceship. So it's sort of following that. There's a sequence in the new uh, film, Fast X, Fast 10 as you were calling it, in which a car is in an aeroplane, jumps out of the aeroplane, hits the road running, gets connected to two helicopters that explode, then goes back into being a plane, and then later on turns up underwater. Well, that seems fair enough. Fine. Um, There's not much to say anymore, except that if you go and see Fast X, you know what you're going to see. I saw it on the BFI BFI IMAX screen in London, which is the biggest screen in the UK and the biggest screen in, well, in In the world. It's not in the world, but it's, you know, anywhere that that one can find. So it's really, really big. And uh, you know exactly what you're going to get. If you, I've forgotten who any of the characters are. I've forgotten, you know, what the connections are from the things that, because there's a whole thing that happens that actually happened five movies ago that I forgot about. I can't remember. There are cameos from uh, people throughout the series who turn up. And, you know, they turn up for the purpose of cameos. There's. Um, Whistle stop visits to London features, and you know, a bit of it's in Rio, and a bit of it's in Portugal, and a bit of it's in Antarctica, and you know, a bit of it's here, and a bit of it's there. And people who were enemies become friends, and people who were friends become enemies. But then, well, and then Vin Diesel goes, family. So it goes, bangy, bangy, bang, crash, crash, bang, bang, bangy, bangy, bang. Family. A bangy, 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 bang, crash, crash, bangy, bang. Oh, I haven't seen them for a while. Family. Bangy, 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 bang. Crash, crash, bangy, bangy, bang. Oh, who's that? Oh, I thought they were. No, it turns out. Ah. Bangy, 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 bang. Is <laughs> and, that a bomb? <laughs> or is it a Death Star? Uh huh. I mean, that's. It, it's very early on in the film, they attempt, somebody attempts to blow up the Vatican. So it's like, okay, 
you know, it's like the Michael Bolton thing. You're at the end of the first line of the first verse. Where are you going to go? Peaked too soon. You peaked too soon, and the film's two hours something long. I mean, it is what it is. Jason Momoa has fun. Um, it's all overcranked loudness, and none of it has any heft because there's a lot of CG. Uh, there's a bit after the most massive explosion happens, and then a news report goes, luckily no lives were lost. You go, don't be silly. It's lit- not you know, casualties were kept to a minimum. Have they got a cold? I mean, what is it's that? It's a television screen. I'm just doing. I'm doing the, the, the version of the television screen. Oh, I see. But but here's the thing: if you go and see it, this is what you're going for. When they rocketed the cast members into space on a car attached to a firework, you know, yes, it seems a bit churlish to go. Well, that wouldn't happen. You go no, but it's F nine or whatever it was at that point. It is what it is. My problem is I'm not engaged because there's not because none of it is none of it is none of it's got any crunch. None of it's got any, it's just loudy, 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 boom, family. I thought I this is the first fast film I've seen. You haven't seen any of the others. I haven't others. seen any of the others because I haven't wow. need, because I haven't needed to. But you know, how were you with the plot? You didn't well, know any of these people beforehand. No, no. But it doesn't make any difference because once they walk on screen, you know who they are. I I thought it, it's like the archers with guns and cars because interesting. Even if you've never, I don't like the archers. But if I hear it, it's like I know what's you going know on. you are. I know who they. Are. Yeah. There's this things happening. I, yeah. I, I've missed forty years or fifty years of plot. <laughs> Fine. Doesn't matter. I'll just join in. So I, so I think of this as the archers. Okay, I think that's a that's a fair enough comparison. Did you did you enjoy Fast X? Well, yes. I mean, on a on a completely superficial level, I admired the scale of the project, which is incredible. You know, and and the just, stunts are well, know, they're not real stunts, and they're but most they can, of them, they can yeah. drive quite fast. And the bit with the dam that was quite good, but you know. So, but but you know, it's the it's the archers. So you know, I'm interested to see what happens. Da 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 da. It is just there's there's just a part of my brain that goes, I'm sorry. The car drives out of the airplane, hits the road, and it's just catch up. Anyway, so that's Fast X with Fast Eleven, presumably not far away. It's the ads in a minute, Mark. But first, it's time to step again into our very entertaining, always very lovely and welcoming laughter lift. I'm looking forward to it. I don't think you are. Oh, that's loud. A little less, a little less there. Hey, hey, Mark. Hey, Simon. The good lady ceramicist here indoors tried to catch me out this week. Name a country with no R in it. I said, no way. Oh, very, yes. That's good, that's good, that's good. Thank you. I've been 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 making my funeral plans before it's, you know, too late. I've asked to be cremated and my ashes pressed into a record. It's my vinyl request. (laughs) I've been... um, Remembering the halcyon days of the London Olympics, Mark, you know, mm. all the way back to 2012. I do. I pulled some strings and I got Child 3 into a practice session of the field sports. He went up to a man with a long stick and said, are you a pole vaulter? He said, no, I'm German, but how did you know my name? <laughs> anyway, I'm not sure about you. Not sure about you, Matt, but as I get older, not only do I simply forget people's names, I seem to confidently call them by the wrong name. It's becoming my Aphrodite's heel. <laughs> like that a gentle a gentle <laughs> That's uh, nice. ripple of yeah. humor yeah. uh what have we got to come these are better than usual thank you uh Bo is afraid which is the ariaster film which we spoke to ariaster about uh last week be back after this unless you're a vanguard easter in which case your instagram feed makes you look like a really fun person to be around and your service will not be interrupted Now, an email from Sean, uh, who gets in touch, correspondence at cobadamo.com. Mm-hmm. Dear Royal Iris and Ben, my Ben, my Cherie. Ben, my, ben McCree. Oh, is, it, is that ben right? Ben McCree, yeah. Do you want to explain that? It's the, the name of a boat that goes uh, backwards and forwards between the island and, well, Liverpool, well, Haitian sometimes, but Liverpool usually. So Sean says, uh, your recent search for uplifting films without any distressing themes leads me to share a recent idea. And the Royal Iris is the boat that goes around on the Mersey where, where the cavern cl- floating cavern club used to be. Thank you. Have you finished that answer now? No, I'm just sorry, but I was just, you know. Having young children not old enough to tolerate even the mildest of threat and not the attention span yet to get beyond 30 minutes, I propose the one-act you 
as in use certificate, yeah. wherein you can watch any film with dire outcomes, but simply leave before the first act finishes. <laughs> so I'd say I'd cite the first Jurassic Park, an exploration of the morality of scientific experiments. Simply exit before the end of Act One, and you've got a jolly dinosaur show with a fantastic score. <laughs> that does work. Does. Just show the first half hour before it all goes wrong. Could your good selves or the listeners suggest any other films that can be converted into a one-act you? Okay, so this is our continuing continuing search for films that you can watch with zero threat. They're good, they're qu- they have quality, they're worth watching, but no threat. Uh, so one-act yous, then adapt various films, which where all falls apart towards the end. Um if you will remember, we had a, an, a listener email some time ago from somebody who had been taken to see Sound of Music and thought that the intermission was the end of the film because that's when they left. So they thought Sound of Music ended with the tanks rolling into Austria. Yeah, that's not a very... Which um, is not the film at all. No, so that becomes that becomes a better film afterwards. Afterwards, exactly. So you just want to, maybe there are films where you just need to see the last half hour <laughs> right, where everything yeah. is okay. It's all right. They got, they've got away over the hills and it's all fine. I, I would think in, in most 30-minute use that Sean is suggesting, there are seeds being planted of the bad stuff to come. Yes. As opposed to it just appearing from nowhere. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking whether or not you could apply it to, because I was thinking, you know, you could do the the version of The Exorcist in which um, uh, a young girl is approaching a birthday and a mother ad- agrees to take her on a sightseeing trip and then take her to the cinema and uh, everything's lovely. But of course, that's actually preceded by the Iraq sequence in which Father Merrin confronts a large statue of a demon. So I haven't seen it. So. No, I know. So you wouldn't, and you're not going to, are you? Not yet, no. no. Um, Keith says, Dear Doctor Who and Doctor What, And, of course, your world-class production team and the great redactor-in-chief. I'm sure you'll get a ton of correspondence. Oh, by the way, uh, we're in the Times today. Oh, are we? Yeah. Why is that? that The story that you told last week, they don't credit us, but anyway, the the story that you told last week about you having a conversation with Oliver Stone, um, and he was surprised that your wife was working. Oh, yeah, that's right, because I said I have to go. He came up, turned up late, and then we were talking, and he said, I have to go, and I I said, well, I said, I've got to pick the kids up from school. And he said, well, can't your wife do it? I said, no, she's working. He went, man, that's tough. So that story is in uh, in the time. Is it? Wow. Yeah, yeah it's very good. Uh, anyway, I'm sure you get a ton of correspondence in whatever spelling on the subject of public information films. Because okay. for a certain generation, then younglings, they were unavoidable. I enjoyed Mark's amused reaction to the mention of polishing a floor and putting a rug on it, which suggested he might not have remembered them. It is available on YouTube. Polish a floor and put a rug on it. You might as well set a man trap. Hurry up, keep him in the warm. All right. I'll put the kettle on. <laughs> and to think he'd only just come from the hospital. That was a public information film. That was it. That's a real thing. Yeah. A real warning against the dangers of polishing a floor and putting a rug on it. Don't you think? Wow, that's niche. How do you, um, hi there. Do you fancy <laughs> polishing a floor and then putting a rug on it? Putting a rug on it. Anyway, Keith says you'll never hear the line to think he'd only just come from the hospital in quite the same way. I imagine. And why did he just have to have come from the hospital? It's... Oh, they've had a baby. Okay, he wasn't you. carrying the much. baby when he when he put his, he slipped on the rug. Wow. I so imagine don't go anywhere near a fridge. Don't polish a floor and put a rug on it. No, beware well, of forklift trucks. Or if you polish a floor, put a rug on it. Oh no, are they saying don't? No, put don't a rug put a rug on it because that makes it. Yes, they're saying if you polish the floor and put a rug on it, but what the it, rug? The rug slidey. But if you get a rug and you put some of that grippy stuff, which is what we do, yeah, then that's fine. Then it's fine. Or just have carpet. <laughs> or just don't polish the floor. I imagine you'll receive many suggestions for memorable uh, public information films. Like Amazing. Spirit of Dark and Lonely Water, yeah, which, which I think is, we mentioned last yeah. week. My own favourite was Play Safe Frisbee, also available on YouTube, in which, egged on by, I presume, his sister, a boy attempts to retrieve a frisbee from an electricity pylon. I'm already <laughs> nervous. It's like the opening of Casualty. <laughs> With hilarious consequences, as they used to say in TV Times. A few years ago, there was a very... <laughs> entertaining hour-long DVD on the best public information films which still survive. It's called Charlie Says, uh, which those Charlie of, says, wait for the dog to of a nostalgic mindset may wish to investigate. Tinkety Tonga, down with the unwary, the show-off and the fool. Because the other one, it wasn't Frisbees, it was never fly a kite near a pylon, wasn't it? Because the idea was that you'd be flying the kite and the kite would hit the pylon yeah. and it would... But it, obviously, 
if you do throw a frisbee, don't climb the up pylon, the pylon. Don't climb up and get it to try and get Just, it. You know, it's only. A but you see, those are the okay. Fly a kite near a pylon. Yeah, get in a fridge on a thing. Yeah. Polish the floor and put a rug on it? Put a rug on it, mate. It's clearly whoever it was that was in that department. It happened to them, and they suddenly thought it was a big deal. Uh, correspondence at Kermanamo.com. So, Bo is afraid. We've already spoken to Ariasta. Uh, Ariasta, indeed. Ariasta. So, this is uh, the new feature from the writer-director of Hereditary, a Hereditary, which he hadn't heard before. He sort of chuckled. Sort of. I still think that's funny. And Mitoma. Um, it is a sprawlingly picaresque uh, third feature, which he described as an anxiety comedy, an odyssey of sorts, an elaborate Jewish joke. He talked about it being inspired by Greek plays and Kafkaesque paranoia, which is, you know, I think pretty much uh, true. It has its roots in a short film from uh, 2011, which was on the internet, now appears to have disappeared from the internet, in which essentially somebody attempting to leave their apartment leaves their key in their suitcase <clears throat> and then the key disappears and then they can't leave the apartment and then a whole bunch of bad stuff happens. That is sort of the initial setup of Bo is Afraid in which uh, Joaquin Phoenix is Bo, who is this anxiety-ridden middle-aged man living in a grim apartment in what appears to be an almost post-apocalyptic cityscape. Outside in the world, there are naked, stabby killers, and um, he's in his apartment. He's got an air ticket to go and visit his mother, and this has cranked his anxiety levels up. He talks to his psychiatrist or his, his therapist who writes one word down in his, on his pad, which is guilt. <laughs> I just think the idea that a psychiatrist would actually write down the word guilt. It's like, you're a therapist. You're riddled with guilt. That's how it works. <laughs> Could you, you provide me with something decent? Yes. Um, and he attempts to leave his apartment, and there's a sort of crossover at the beginning. And then what happens is he misses his plane due to car crash circumstances. He suddenly finds himself embarking upon this episodic odyssey, one of the sections of which is that he wakes up in the bed of people he's never met before, but who have accidentally run him down. Here's a clip. Am I dead? No, no. You've been healing so quickly. And n no organs were hit, and your, your bleeding was really mild. What this is a room is? This is a room in our house, but it's your home for as long as you need. My name's Grace. Oh, this is Roger. This is my husband. Hey, Kai. Welcome back. Thought you'd sleep in, huh? Roger's a very respected surgeon. He's the one who dressed and treated your wounds. You're a lucky man. What was this? That's my little assistant health monitor. Keeps track of your condition. That I should say that's Nathan Lane who it comes is Nathan in. Lane, yes. Who is I'm afraid as soon as he came on, I was going, Akuna, Matata. Because he's either Timon or Pumbaa, one of the two, Akuna. And that's just such a great moment. And he, he's great in it, but it kind of took me out. So then he's in this kind of dream home, but in every dream home, a heartache, because in fact, there's there's anguish and grief in the dream home that he suddenly finds himself on the wrong paint splattered end of. Then there is a weird section in which he disappears off into the woods, meets a sort of hippie woodland traveling theater group who like to blur the boundaries between the performers and the artists in uh, unexpected ways. He continues this odyssey en route to his mother's house and we discover more and more about how this situation is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. I mean, I won't say any more in terms of what literally happens, although it, you couldn't really spoil the plot because it's not to do with plot revelation. The whole thing has um, a sort of nightmarish logic to it, particularly at the be at the beginning, but the, the, the logic of the whole film is nightmarish in the way of David Lynch's Eraserhead. It makes sense on a kind of paranoid, anxiety, stressy level. It obviously makes no absolute real sense. The whole thing is as Ari Aster was saying, it's very arch, it's very unreal. I mean, he was describing it at one point, I think Nathan Lane described it at one point as a, as a three-hour panic attack. And that's that's sort of the tone of it. Now, the question is whether or not the, the film is good, bad, or indescribable. <clears throat> I think the answer to it is this. We sat in the same room and watched it. 
And I think the opening is really taut and there's a very, very funny joke very early on in which he has to go out of his apartment and he leaves the building door open and there are catastrophic consequences. And it's really, it's funny. Like it's laugh out loud funny. Some of the sections and each- It was for you. It was for me. And I laughed. You didn't. And did you, you were there with somebody. In fact, you didn't laugh at all during the whole film. I did laugh once. <clears> when was a, that? There was a portrait of a woman. With oh, yes. With the big eyes, which face. like the like the Tim Burton thing. Okay, fine. So, um, so some sections of it work better than others. Uh, some sections, are, the, every section feels like it's in a different genre. So it's- uh, it, it is a game of many halves and many parts, and some bits work better than other bits, although the whole thing has a kind of uh, a, a momentum that feels a bit like, you know, Voltaire Goes to Hell via Darren Aronofsky's Mother, which again is a, another film which it reminded me of, which I remember you hated. Could, absolutely hated. Um, I think that when it's at its best, it's got a kind of, you know, a, a a barreling psychological energy that reminds me of of Punch Drunk Love, and as I said, he raises head. And I think at its worst, it reminds me of Charlie Kaufman's Synecdoche, New York. What I do think is, if you don't find it funny, it will be insufferable. It will be like a toothache or a migraine. Mm -hmm. However, the 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 penultimate section. I I thought you said go ahead. Open your Kermode and Mayo branded bottle because I want I people realize, to hear. I didn't realize how noisy how it was. noisy it is, but just do because it's it kept the water so lovely cool. and cold, and I love the the dusted mm. uh, coating. Very good, nicely, nicely, nicely made, nicely done. Yeah, it's a solid item. It is. You can put down. Are you refreshed? I feel so much more refreshed. Shall than I carry I was on. Before. Sorry, carry okay. on. Okay, yeah. so in that sort of penultimate section, I. I laughed more than I've laughed in many a comedy film. And it was very interesting that as we were, as we finished the interview with, with Darren Aron with um, uh, Ari Aster, and he said off, you know, off the recording, he said, did you find it funny? I said, I found it much funnier than I thought I was going to, because I did Which think- Which doesn't actually, it was very good. It's a very good answer. No, because I, I had not expected it to be as funny as it is. And I think that there is- It's not that funny, really. No, I think bits of it are hilariously funny. Like, and there are jokes in, the, in some sections that I've been laughing about ever since. It is- Unbelievably indulgent, deliberately so. It is like it is. You, I think you asked Ari Aster at one point, "Who did he make the film for?" And the answer is, he made it for himself. Yes. Which is, oh, that's got to be a problem, hasn't it? That's got to be a red flag. It's certainly uh, there's. It is certainly not for everyone. And at th and at <laughs> three so hours, true. if you take if you if you don't find it funny, if and I and I I'll say I keep saying this, I did. There are things about it that are like slapstick, psychological, Freudian humour that I j just tickled me. And I do think that whole thing that it's reducible to a shaggy dog story, the main gag of which is. What if your mother could hear all those things you tell your therapist, which I do find a funny idea. So on the one hand, it's long, ill-disciplined, unruly, sprawling, headachey, all those other things. On the other hand, it is peculiar, hilarious, slapstick, um, absurdist, you know, is it with nodding its head to matter of life and death one minute, and I think to airplane the next minute, because there are some sight gags in it that happen so fast you almost miss them. It is a game of many halves, and I think it is one of the few films in which it's not possible to say it's good or it's bad, and this is why I hate uh, that kind of that binary thing. There are things about it that I loved. There are things about it that I found insufferable. I think you found all of it insufferable. Pretty much, yes, pretty much. <laughs> but it's still possible to admire bits yeah. of it as it goes And through. I actually even like the bits that I find insufferable. Um, poly this information from the National Archive. Okay. Polish a floor, put a rug on it. And you might as well set a man trap, right? Like many of the featured public information films, The Fatal Floor, which is what it's called, mm -hmm. is an amusing short oh, that could easily... Oh, The Fatal Floor as in F-L-O-O-R. Yes. Very good. Is an amusing short that could easily feature in a comedy sketch show. Yet recent findings suggest that there may need to remake The Fatal Floor for the 21st century. Why? Findings released in 2004 showed that certain fashion trends had become more dangerous to the well-being of the nation than criminals... Or disease. What? The Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents 
reported that the number of victims falling foul of parquet floors or polished floorboards has risen 400%. Hang on, falling foul of, of, a, of a rug on a polished floor? Yeah, polished floor or a parquet floor. So they've, they've fallen over because, because of the, the floor was polished. It's risen by 400% from 2,900 in 1998 to 12,300 in 2003. So this is 20 years ago. Oh. I, it may well be that there's more up-to-date wow. information. So maybe we need the fatal floor remade to warn people that you have to be careful of your flooring. Because the, because, sorry, the parquet flooring thing, because the parquet flooring is polished or yes. because parquet has got lots of little weird bits in it. Same. Okay, well, I'd like to say something, which is I sneered and laughed at that, but you then presented me with factual information, yes. which proves that my sneering and laughing was incorrect. Right-wing Christian Trump supporters... Take note, you dimwit. Put a rug on it. <laughs> That's right, yes. It, are you a right-wing Christian Trump supporter? In which case, polish your floor and put a rug on it. Yeah. You know, the way Trump has on his head. Um, <laughs> what's on? This is where uh, you email us a voice note about your festival or special screening from wherever you might be in the world. Correspondence at Here are this week's top correspondents. Hello, Simon and Mark. This is Yula Horsha from People's Palace Projects. We are bringing three incredible Indigenous filmmakers from Brazil to London for the Echoes Indigenous Film Festival. They've selected 18 short films exploring the diversity of Indigenous storytelling at a time of climate emergency. Echoes at the ICA from the 19th to 21st of May. Hello, Mark and Simon. Peter Blunden here to tell the listeners about the Romford Film Festival, which will run from the 24th to the 30th of May for our seventh edition. You can enjoy movies ranging from first-time filmmakers to some of the most established names on the independent film circuit. We also have special guests, free industry talks and Q&As. A week's pass is just £35. Full info can be found at romfordfilmfestival.com. So we have Peter Blunden telling us about the Romford Film Festival, 24th to the 30th of May, and Eula Rocha promoting the Indigenous Film Festival at the ICA on the 19th to the 21st of May, where they'll be bringing three Indigenous filmmakers to London for Q&A sessions. Um, thanks very much to Eula and Peter. Send your trailer, please, to correspondence at Kermit Did you get that weird sound of a plane landing in your head? No. You didn't get that? It sounded like have an F one was landing in my head. Have you been taking the medication? No, no, no. It came it's in my headphones. Yeah, it went, literally when you went into the thing, it was like, it like really, really like a. I think Mark has actually lost it. No, I haven't point. lost it. It was. Just, it was. They're playing you a special. They're playing me a special thing. Special okay, noises. fine. So, so, so what? So what did we hear? Because almost the first thing was, was complete. The, the devil is sending you messages. Is it? It's going. Trump won. Trump won. Trump won. Anyway, just it was all fine. Everything all that you good. missed, it, it was all particularly <laughs> was, great. That was just the most remarkable thing. Correspondence at kerbinandmayo.com. That is it for the end of Take One before Mark loses it completely. This has <laughs> been a Sony Music Entertainment production. The team was Lily Hambly, Ryan O'Meara, Sancho Panza, Gully Tikel, Basrak Erton, Johnny Socials, Hannah Talbot, and the producer was Simon Poole. And he was, no, the producer was Hannah Talbot, and the redactor is Simon Poole. I mean, basically, they're all interchangeable. And to be honest, Lily runs the show. It's all hers. Mark, what is your film of the week? <sighs> you sound so surprised because I do always end with this particular question. Hello, God. Are you there? Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Thank you for listening. Our extra takes with a bonus review, a bunch of recommendations, and even more stuff about the movies and cinema adjacent television is available right now because it's landed in your inbox at exactly the same time. That's the way it works. Take three will arrive in your device's inbox next Wednesday. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. While you're here, check out all the other videos because they're cool too, aren't they? Yeah, and if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermit and Mayo's take, then check out our social channels. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I, I would. I have done. Excellent.